Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, this is a big room. Um, this is the second fanciest room I've ever presented in, so thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm Tom Dottel. I'm the director of the Division of Economic and Technical Analysis at FERC. I'm gonna talk about uh, Order 881, which is a final rule we issued a few years back on transmission line ratings. Um, and I'll talk about what that means. Oh, there's me. Uh, before I get to that, um, I have to uh, fulfill my obligation to some lawyers at FERC and tell you that I'm only gonna express my own opinion. I'm not gonna speak for any of the commissioners. And then I'm also gonna simplify some of the policies a little bit just to make this a little more accessible. But if you wanna see the gory details, please visit the actual orders. There's a, they're at our website. At the end of the slides, there's also a, a further reading slide that has a lot of links to uh, various documents that might help. Um, so this is just an overview of what I'm gonna talk about. So in 2021, FERC issued Order 881 to reform policies related to the calculation of limits on transmission line flows. So we call those transmission line ratings or just line ratings. Order 881 sought to address unjust and unreasonable electricity rates caused by artificially constrained power flow or power markets. Uh, the order, under the order, line ratings have to now be more accurate and calculated more frequently than they did before the order. Uh, the order also required transmission providers to share line rating data with various entities. And so MISO and GE will present on a related project to that data exchange. And I'm just here to kind of warm up the crowd for them. Um, and the lawyers also told me I had to say, FERC is not involved in the trolley project, but we're happy to support them. So. Okay, um, I'm gonna skim the surface of wholesale power markets just to kind of set the stage for, for what this policy is and why it matters. Um, I might start off actually by talking about what wholesale powers, power markets are not. So each one of you pays a utility bill to your utility and they send you power over a distribution system and that whole transaction and relationship is a retail market. So that is not what we regulate. And then upstream of that, your utility purchases power either from independent generators or from other utilities. And that power is sent over a transmission system. And that is the, the, the transmission, that's the transmission system in the wholesale power market. So that is federally jurisdictional and FERC regulates that. Um, so those wholesale power markets take, take two different forms or have two structures. One is a centralized structure where power is uh, bought and sold in computerized auctions that are held every five minutes. Um, and then there are bilateral markets where utilities uh, buy and sell energy with um, producers and other utilities and individual transactions that are negotiated and uh, individual contracts are, are executed. Regardless of the structure, all wholesale power markets move their wholesale power from the generators to the, to the load via the transmission system. So the objective of all wholesale power markets, regardless of the structure, is to reliably serve electricity consumers at a low cost. Uh, or in a more technical way of saying that, uh, to use the available generators in a manner that minimizes cost subject to technical constraints. And there's a lot of technical constraints. Um, some of them are just that the model uh, represent the actual real world, so they're like physical physics constraints. And then there's a lot of just like limitations and other and de definitions of, of uh, products and things like that. And one of the key constraints is the flow limits on transmission lines or the line rating constraint. So, um, Centralized markets solve this opt as a kind of a formal optimization that they uh, solve explicitly in those five minute auctions. And bilateral markets try to achieve the same outcome, um, but through that, those exchanges, the uh, bilateral exchanges in a competitive market. Um, and again, in either case, the line ratings are a key limit that controls um, how cheap the power can be and how efficient the market can be. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but this is just to show you a very simplified version of the formal optimization problem that the centralized markets solve. They have an objective function, which is production cost. 
um, and they minimize that subject to all these constraints. And you can just see there the third constraint listed just says that the, the flow on any line k has to be less than or equal to the, the rating on, on that line. So that defines one of the feasible spaces of the, the solution to the optimization. In bilateral markets, they don't formally solve an optimization. Instead, individual market participants manage their own resources and loads through the bilateral purchases and sales. Uh, they use transmission service to move their purchase power to their loads. And the availability of that transmission service, um, one of the key limits on the availability is the line ratings, uh, the, the ratings of their individual lines. So what are line ratings? They're power flow limits that system operators put on their transmission lines to prevent problems at the simplest, the simplest level. Uh, there are three different kinds of, of limits, and a, a line rating reflects the most limiting type. Um, there are thermal limits, uh, voltage limits, and stability limits. Um, I'm not going to talk about voltage and stability limits, except to say that they're not relevant to Order 881. Uh, Order 881 had to do with uh, thermally limited transmission lines. Um, thermal limits seek to prevent a line from getting too hot. Um, lines heat up when you put power through the line. Uh, there's resistance, so the current causes resistive heating. Um, and, and hot lines are a problem for two reasons. First of all, hot lines sag. And when a line sags, the clearance between the line and the ground or people or whatever decreases. Um, and that can cause safety and reliability problems and also legal problems because there's technical standards that are required by law to meet certain clearances. Um, also, above a certain temperature, the metal in a conductor will weaken through a process called annealing. And that will mean that the, the line could deform or, or lose its tensile strength and become damaged. Um, so, um, to determine a transmission line, you start with a design temperature for the conductor. And that's specified by the manufacturer of the conductor or by the engineer that designs the, the structures and the, the orientation of the transmission lines and will know at what temperatures you'll have what clearances. Um, so once you have the design temperature, um, you go to a standard like IEEE 738. And that will walk you through an engineering analysis that basically does a heat balance um, to figure out where, um, what the limiting uh, power flow through the line is that will, that will keep you below your, des your design temperature. Uh, and that has three components, resistive heating, convective cooling, uh, and solar heating um, are the three main components. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, but basically um, you know, the, the analysis sets up this, this balance where total heating equals total cooling um, uh, plotted across power flow across the line. Where those things equal, that's like your equilibrium point, and that is your line rating. Um, you'll notice if you send more power than that rating, you're to the right of, of that equilibrium point, then the heating is above the cooling and your line will heat up and you'll, you'll violate the, the design temperature. So this is just a summary of the effects of different types of weather parameters on line ratings. Um, wind speed, if you increase your wind speed, your convective cooling increases, and then your, your line rating also increases. Uh, if you increase wind direction, and by that I mean deviation from parallel, so convective cooling is more effective when the, when the wind or the forced movement of the, the convective fluid is more perpendicular to the line. So if, you, if you're closer to that, then your, your line rating will also go up. If you increase ambient air temperature, then your uh, ability to cool the line from that decreases because it's hotter, so your, your line rating will go down. Um, likewise, if you increase the sun intensity, that tends to heat the line and your line rating will go down and increasing cloud cover obviously will reduce or eliminate the, the sun that's reaching the line and will, will allow you to increase your, your line rating. So these are some quantitative examples from Idaho National Laboratory. I'm not going to go through these either, except to say that the effects of wind are, are pretty stark. Um, you can double your, or double your line rating using wind, at least theoretically. Um, uh, the air temperature effects are also significant. 
but less than, than wind is. And solar irradiance, you can't see it great here, um, but there's a, it's a smaller but still not insignificant effect. You can increase your line rating around 10 to 15% in theory from, from solar irradiance. So that's how to determine a line rating kind of in a vacuum. Um, and then there's a question of how do you apply that, that approach in specific uh, instances in a, in a utility or a transmission provider. So the two traditional approaches are static and seasonal line ratings. So static line ratings are calculated based on the worst case weather conditions that are anticipated across the lifetime of the line. Um, so they're typical, typically set when you are designing and constructing the line, and then they don't change for the life of the line, typically. Seasonal line ratings are slightly more dynamic than static line ratings, but they're essentially static line ratings where you define different uh, static ratings for, for different seasons. And I also mentioned traditionally those seasons have been a six-month summer and a six-month winter period, so they're not even particularly granular at least as they've been traditionally used. Over the past years, um, some transmission providers have been uh, moving towards slightly uh, uh, more dynamic approaches to line ratings. Um, and these are usually the form of either ambient adjusted ratings or dynamic line ratings. So ambient adjusted ratings are AARs are line ratings that are adopt, uh, um, updated close to real time to reflect short-term forecasts of ambient air temperature. Um, there's also some approaches that also consider the lack of solar heating in nighttime hours, like in the PJM, what PJM does currently. Um, there's several US transmission providers, including some centralized markets that have adopted some form of AARs already, and some have been doing so for years. Um, Beyond AARs or DLRs, those are line ratings which uh, they're similar to AARs, but they incorporate additional weather variables such as wind, wind speed and wind direction and the, the sun and cloud cover. And typically DLRs are supported by um, various types of solars that are installed near or on the line and that help with forecast training and validation. Um, and there are several U.S. transmission providers that have piloted or adopted uh, some forms of DLRs on specific lines. So since in 2019, uh, FERC began an initiative, a public, public initiative to uh, examine these more advanced line rating practices. We held some tech conferences and uh, went through some process. And then in 2021, we issued Order 881. Um, and it requires the adoption of AARs. So FERC found that in many cases, relying on seasonal and static ratings resulted in artificial congestion that produced electricity rates that were not just and reasonable. So that's the legal standard that we have under the Federal Power Act. So if we find something's causing unjust and unreasonable rates, we have to remedy that. So we remedied that problem by requiring widespread adoption of AARs for thermally limited transmission lines by July 2025. So there are a lot of details of the flavor of AARs that be required, but I'll go through a few. Um, I, guess a, I guess a better way of saying that first bullet is any transmission operations that happen within 10 days have to use an AAR. So whether it's evaluating and approving transmission service requests, running a centralized market, or curtailing, deciding you need to curtail a transaction. If that is in the next 10 days, you have to use an AAR. We also said that after 10 days, you can't use static ratings anymore. You have to at least use seasonal ratings, and they have to be based on four seasons. Um, AARs also have to apply to a period not longer than one hour, so we went from maybe 50 years down to one hour, which is better. Um, they have to be recalculated each hour, and they have to be recalculated to reflect up-to-date forecasts of air temperature, um, and the absence of solar heating in nighttime hours. Uh, we provided exceptions. We're not animals, so we know they're special cases, so we, we uh, provided flexibility. 
And then we also, uh, Order 881 also established a new proceeding to consider potential requirements for DLRs in the future. Um, and I just note that, so I, I mentioned some parties already did uh, have AARs on their system. For a lot of parties, this is going to be brand new. And even for the parties that already did AARs, this is an expansion, maybe a significant expansion of their forecasting and data retention policies. Um, and there's a lot of data. So we require transmission providers to calculate ratings out 10 days, which is 240 hours uh, of hourly ratings for each transmission line. So that means that in one day, uh, for one line, you'd have to calculate over 5,000 ratings. Um, and many transmission providers have hundreds or thousands of transmission lines. So it won't be unusual for a utility to have to calculate a million transmission lines in one day. Um, so that, that's a lot of data, even, even for people who were previously doing some form of AARs. Um, and then Order 881 also required uh, certain things with respect to data sharing. So first, all line ratings have to be kept and archived in a database for five years that's uh, accessible to market participants. And then also, line ratings have to be shared in a timely manner upon request from any transmission provider. That kind of sharing has gone on for decades. Um, it's, it's important when you operate your system, you affect your neighbor's system and vice versa, so you have to know certain technical things about their systems. Um, but 881 obviously required the production of a lot more data that needs to be shared. Um, and there's just, it, they're updated more frequently and there's more of them. So uh, MISO and GE were working on compliance for MISO and they uh, spearheaded this trolley project with LF Energy um, to try to address that challenge. That's the subject of the next presentation. Um, that's everything I had. That's, so if you're interested, will they get these slides? Probably, okay. If you don't, um, email me and I can send you some of these links, but here are some uh, links to uh, other documents and proceedings that might be of interest. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. The, change the resistance? So I don't think anything that we've said would prevent a, tr a utility from doing that. The resistance is part of the IEEE 738 analysis. Um, so that's a great question. I'll say I don't know how transmission providers do it. It wasn't the subject of Order AA1, but it's, that's, that's a, a good point. And, it could be that, that it's important to do that. Any other questions? Yeah. What I've heard is more that internationally they're they're kind of further along than we are on dynamic line ratings. Um, I don't. I, I'm not sure exactly um, what the state is with respect to. AARs, um, and and also there's different ways. They're not every way they're using dynamic line ratings internationally seems like it's within the same market context that we are. But um, but yeah, I, sorry. With regard to AARs, I'm not entirely sure. But certainly with regard to dynamic line ratings, they're they're being used internationally quite a bit. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that's. I mean, that'd be great. It would. Um, I know part of part of the initiative that I talked about that started in, in 2019. We did look at international experience and tried to do outreach, not just domestically, but with a lot of international parties. Um, I think most of what we heard about and talked about was dynamic line ratings, but um, I, it, I think the AR approach. I know there's a lot of um, desire to go further 
and do something more dynamic. We're, we're considering that now, that proceeding's open, but certainly the AAR, there, there is some low-hanging fruit, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if parties in other parts of the world uh, want to look at what we did and decide if it's right for them. Yes? So, uh, so I think one of, the, one of the themes we heard when we did outreach was parties that have implemented dynamic line readings know more about those lines than any other lines in their system. I'm not sure that means, I mean, for, from a planning perspective, they know a lot about the other lines too. So I'm not, I'm not totally sure that expansion of data is going to be hugely critical in the, in the planning, but it could be. Um, I think we've heard some some people say they can sometimes use DLRs as a bridge to when they need to expand um, a system, but um, I don't think we've thought about DLRs, at least to date, in terms of like a, a replacement for planning. I mean, if you need to build, you need to build. DLRs are not available sometimes. Sometimes it's hot, and if, you, if that's going to be a peak day, you may not be able to rely on that. So there, there may be some interactions, but um, at least as we've kind of contemplated them so far, that they're, they're not a replacement for each other. So I don't know, did that answer your question or? Okay. Any other questions? Um, I mean, I think we've heard a lot that there are incentive issues with the current rate designs. Um, so um, certainly that's a theme of, the, of what's being talked about in the discourse community around this is, you know, um, paying utilities to, to invest in things will mean that they understandably, through no fault of their own, that's just the system, have that incentive. So that is one stumbling block. Uh, we have our proceeding open also looking at that. Um, but, um, but it's, a, it's a tricky issue. Um, other than that, just com getting comfort with these technologies. There's a lot of transmission providers that um, might be interested, but they're understandably kind of uh, reticent to take a risk. I mean, the, the upside for increasing the marginal capacity in your line is, is it's something, but if you mess it up and cause a reliability problem, that's a, that's a serious downside. Um, so I think getting the, the technology kind of more proven, even if it's proven today, just getting that to be more common knowledge and more, more understood across the industry would help. Um, it's probably, probably two of the biggest impediments. And then Alex, did you have a question? Okay. All right, am I out of time? Oh, sorry, three more minutes. Any, any other questions? <laughs> yes. Do we feel like both of these stability constraints are a solved problem to reduce our exposure to the line of bandwidth, or is there a discussion of a fundamental problem? I don't think Order 881 just has anything to say about that. They're just separate concerns. So where there are thermal, the question was, are voltage and stability constraints a solved problem? Or, or um, yeah, I would just say they're, they're just outside the scope of what we're doing in Order 881. I guess I'm not sure you couldn't conceive of, of some advanced way of doing those more dynamically, but they're, they're very complicated often, and it's hard to like just plug in a few assumptions about weather and, and understand what some of those limits are sometimes. So, um, so for the time being anyway, I'd say they're, 
they're their own entity and their own problem and they're gonna have to be kind of solved like they are now or we'll have to innovate on that, so. Anything else? Okay, well thank you very much.